um, can die. They really don't do very well when the uh, membrane is fairly solid-like. Okay? The, me the cells need to have some fluidity. There's things that have to come into and out of cells. And so if you've got a membrane that's rigid and the, the proteins that are there can't function, the cell can literally die. So when we look at, at cells, this is a very interesting thing, especially from a nut nutritional point of view. When we look at individual cells from organisms, we discover that the composition of the unsaturated fatty acids that they have really varies with the environment in which the organism is living. Real good example, fish live in the ocean. They live completely surrounded by water, and generally that water, unless they're tropical fish, uh, is fairly chilly. You go catch a, co a, a fish off the Oregon coast, and it's living in a temperature that would kill you if you were exposed to it for a couple of hours in the ocean. Okay? Now that fish is swimming along just fine and dandy. And one of the reasons, so, so the first thing, the first clue that we have then is I've told you that the membranes have to be different. If fish had membranes that were like our membranes, the fish would not be alive either. Now I'm not saying that we die because of our membranes freezing. I'm, don't, don't, don't take that w with me here. But we don't live in the ocean. Okay? The fish have to live in that environment, so to tolerate those lower temperatures, they have membranes that contain much more unsaturated fatty acids. That allows their membranes to stay fluid at a lower temperature. Okay? Now, uh, one of the reasons that fish oil is good for you is because it's full of polyunsaturated fatty acids. And the reason it's full of polyunsaturated fatty acids is partly to keep its membranes fluid at the lower temperature. Okay? There are organisms that have to live in very hot environments. There are some, for example, that live in literally boiling water. And when we look at their membrane lipids, we find that they're more saturated, not surprisingly, and they have other considerations as well. So the membranes have to be structured specifically according to the environments in which they are uh, found. Okay? Now, what cholesterol does, as I said, is it um, widens the transition temperature. So if we were to plot, uh, let's say for a given uh, membrane, a um, a plot of, let's say, fluidity versus temperature, what we would see is we would start with low fluidity, at low, low fluidity at low temperature, and as the temperature increases, the fluidity will go up at a point, and then it will level off at a new fluid level. Okay? <coughs> Cholesterol, what it will do is take that temperature that instead of just goes up and goes over, is it will widen it. So it just goes more slowly up like that. Widening that transition temperature may be very useful for cells to be able to have some uh, characteristics of fluidity and some characteristics of, of solidness as well. And so cholesterol is widening that, that transition temperature between the fluid and the solid state, again, probably to give cells some of the advantages of both states. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, um, so here's uh, a schematic example if you had a hard time envisioning what that transition looks like. Here is a more solid state. We see things much more organized, much more lined up, more, much more regimented. The more fluid state we see over here, and things are literally moving around a lot more, uh, as we would expect when we had a fluid. Okay, now... Um, Relative to, um, uh, again, nutrition, diet, health, uh, et cetera, um, there's a big um, awareness that's happened uh, over the past few years with respect to the uh, problems associated with uh, what are called trans fats. And so I want to just say a brief word uh, about that here. Um, if we look at... Um, the, the, recall the difference between a fat and an oil is the, temp the difference is that a fat is solid at room temperature and an oil is liquid at room temperature. And we think about um, um, uh, if I'm a food manufacturer, I have a couple things in mind. One, there may be reasons I want to have something that's solid at room temperature instead of liquid at room temperature. So what if I alter the fat in some way, it'll alter the oil in some way so that it now changes its melting point? Well, one of the ways that you can do that is you can add hydrogen to the unsaturated fat, and those hydrogens will fill in some of the double bonds, and it will become 
less unsaturated or more saturated, as it were. And the more saturated that that, that oil becomes, the higher, it's, uh, the higher its melting temperature will be so that it could become a solid at room temperature. Well, that's frequently done uh, in the food industry, and for many years it was thought to be quite innocuous. Margarine, for example, is partially hydrogenated vegetable oil. Whenever you see the term partially hydrogenated vegetable oil, that's what's going on with um, a, um, uh, uh, an oil. Okay? Partially, partial hydrogenation means you're not adding hydrogen to fill in every double bond. You're only filling in some of the double bonds. And in fact, that's where the trans fats come in. If you recall when I described the fatty acids to you, I showed you that all the fatty acids that are made in biology, or essentially all the fatty acids made in biology, have cis double bonds. When you start adding hydrogen partially to fatty acids in fats, what happens is that the partial leads to the rearrangement of double bonds in those fatty acids, and some of them end up with a trans double bond. That gives rise to what's called trans fats. Trans fats are a lot in the news, and trans fats are linked to much uh, increased levels of atherosclerosis. They're probably worse for you than the saturated fats themselves. So for many years, Americans were taught, oh, margarine is better for you because it's got vegetable oil and so forth. And what they didn't know or they didn't tell you was that it was loaded with trans fat. Okay? Now, the issue about trans fat, is, as dietitians, many of you probably know, uh, is that you'll see many foods, for example, that are labeled as trans fat free. And all that that means is that the level of trans fat in a given serving is less than a half a gram. Right? You, you know that, right? Okay. You can have a significant amount of trans fat in what you're eating, even if you have something that's called trans fat free. So my advice to students is always read the labels. And if it says partially hydrogenated blank oil, you may assume it has trans fat, regardless of what the label says. Okay. Now, uh, membranes are interesting uh, or are essential uh, for cells to have a barrier between themselves and the environment. But if they're a perfect barrier, then cells could not be alive because cells have to get nutrients from outside and they have to get rid of wastes that are on the inside. I told you, for example, that membranes are not uh, impermeable to water, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and carbon monoxide, meaning that they can move across membranes fairly readily, and fortunately that's the case. We want to get rid of the carbon dioxide, we want to bring in oxygen. Okay? Water and uh, carbon monoxide are a little bit different matters, but uh, certainly oxygen and carbon dioxide uh, make a lot of sense. Well, cells need things besides water and oxygen and carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide to live. They need to have nutrients. So uh, if the lipid bilayer is providing a barrier to those nutrients, there has to be some other way to get those nutrients in. And in fact, that's where proteins that um, uh, perform these functions are involved. So membranes of all cells have proteins that are involved in the transport of specific chemicals or specific biochemicals across the membrane. So a real good example is uh, virtually every cell in your body has what's called a glucose transporter meaning that it will specifically recognize glucose and it will move it from outside of the cell to inside the cell. So as your blood supply is delivering glucose uh, throughout your body, when the cell needs some glucose, its transporter grabs some and brings it into the cell. Okay. Well, proteins uh, that are associated with the cell membrane come in about four different types. And so I want to I give some names to these so that you guys are aware. Generally, transport proteins will have the uh, structure shown in number one. That is, they will project through both sides of the lipid bilayer. That makes sense because it has to, if we, the, this protein is grabbing a glucose on the outside and moving it to the inside, it's got to have some uh, pathway to get it all the way across the lipid bilayer. This type of protein labeled in number one is called an integral membrane protein. An integral membrane protein is one that projects through both uh, layers of the lipid bilayer. Okay. Now, I'm going to give some different names to these than your book does. So please use my names in um, uh, describing these. Okay. This is an integral membrane protein. Number two is one that isn't real common. Okay. 
And it's, it's, in fact, your book is one of the few places you'll ever even see it listed. It's, it's called an embedded membrane protein. Okay. Number three um, is a protein that, uh, as you can see, only goes th through one layer of the lipid bilayer, but not the other one. And we won't talk much about this type of protein. I'm sorry, number four. I said number three. Number, number, number four. I'm jumping ahead. Uh, number four projects through one layer of the lipid bilayer, not both of them. And uh, this uh, type of membrane protein is called a peripheral membrane protein. We'll say a, a couple words about peripherals later. But suffice it to say, they don't go all the way through. And because they don't go all the way through, they're much more able to move through the membranes. We'll see that, especially when we talk about the mitochondria and the chloroplasts, that there are proteins that are moving back and forth like crazy through these membranes. And so a peripheral membrane protein is much more fluid and much more able to move than is an integral membrane protein, which really has to get a lot of stuff out of the way in order for it to move. The last one is number three, and at least the last one in my head, the last one would have been number four, but the last one in my head, number three, is what I call an associated membrane protein. Okay? An associated membrane protein is usually found close to the membrane, and it may be um, in some close association. So three and four, for example, might interact, and four might help hold number three close to the membrane. So we see it associated, that is, when we look for the th number three, we find it around membranes, but we don't see it embedded in any way. So I'll repeat those names. So number one is integral. Number two is uh, embedded. Number three is associated. And number four is peripheral. Okay? Yes, Lynette. So there's a variety of ways. It may have some association with something that's already in the membrane. Uh, there may be a fatty acid it associates with there. It may associate with a protein or even with uh, some of these, as we'll see, have, have sugar residues on them, so it may be associated with that. But it's not in any way embedded in the membrane. It's not, it's not stuck in the membrane in, in any way. OK. Let's see. There's one last category, and why they didn't put it on that last uh, slide, I don't know, uh, of proteins that we find with membranes. It's kind of like the associated, but it actually has a, uh, a closer uh, relationship to the membrane. And these are proteins that are called anchored. Okay? Anchored membrane proteins are proteins that are attached to something that itself is attached in the membrane. So here is a fatty acid. It's stuck in this membrane. So it's stuck. In, if, if this protein weren't there, this fatty acid would just line itself up very nicely with this membrane like you see here. But this protein has been attached to it. And so as a consequence, this fatty acid is acting as an anchor for this anchored protein. This is a very common way of holding a protein to a membrane. Notice the protein itself, again, is not embedded in any way. But it's physically attached to something that is uh, uh, attached to the membrane, in this case, a fatty acid. That make sense? OK. So five different uh, proteins there, membrane proteins. All right, well, here's some chaos going on for us. This shows us now sort of schematically, um, if we were to look up, up close and personal the membrane what we might see uh, looking across it. So we can see in here, for example, that we've got peripheral membrane proteins here. They go through one lipid bilayer. We can see we've got some integral membrane proteins here. Okay. Um, we, can't, uh, we don't see any embedded proteins in here. They do label some cholesterols with sort of yellow uh, color that you see them scattered through various places. And we see that some of these proteins have attached to them what are called oligosaccharides. These are sugar residues. And sugar residues can be attached to proteins in the lipid bilayer. The sugar residues can also be attached to the uh, glycerophospholipids or